So um, again, if you've just joined us, good morning. Uh, this is the uh, Safe Food Alliance webinar, uh, Sampling for Success, Products, the Processing Environment, and more. Um, your presenters today, uh, I am Wiley Hall. I'm the Director of Research Chemistry uh, at our lab in Kingsburg, California. You know, I've been uh, about 10 years or so working on uh, pesticide residues, uh, kind of uh, measuring uh, toxic chemicals in the environment, um, and then research into post-harvest quality and uh, feed and transport of chemicals. Uh, with me today, my uh, co-presenter is uh, Tom Jones, our Senior Director of Analytical Services, whose uh, background is in uh, microbiology, including pathogen detection, and um, you know now as is more uh, exalted uh, position, um, also does a lot of uh, you know, reach out to uh, you know, industry and the uh, government around uh, food uh, safety issues. We are broadcasting to you today from our makeshift studios and our uh, squirreled our way in our offices at the uh, Kingsburg Center, uh, just south of Fresno, uh, for those of you not familiar with the Central Valley. Uh, if you take a look on the right, you can also see uh, some of our other uh, locations. Uh, Mainly, uh, Ubis, you know, uh, Kingsburg is our uh, main laboratory. Uh, we also have laboratory services in uh, Yuba City and our uh, corporate uh, location in uh, Sacramento. Just uh, you know, a brief uh, description of the company if you're not familiar with us. Um, you know, we have uh, kind of three divisions, uh, Safe Food Alliance, uh, which is where uh, Tom and I live, uh, Safe Food Certifications, and then uh, the DFA of California is our parent company. So uh, you can kind of see the division of uh, responsibilities here. Uh, DFA of California, again, is where the uh, company began back in 1908. Um, so it you know, involves things like uh, commodity inspection for uh, you know, a number of different uh, commodities, uh, walnuts, uh, prunes, uh, almonds, uh, you know, cut fruit, things like that. Uh, Safe Food Alliance is where our, uh, most of our food safety services live, uh, so that's laboratory testing, but also uh, training, consulting, and uh, various audits. And then uh, for situations where the auditing needs to be kind of firewalled from the rest of the company to uh, ensure uh, independence, we have Safe Food Certifications. So those are the uh, third-party certification audits, uh, including also uh, Costco Supplier. All right, here we go. So uh, we're going to start the uh, actual uh, information part of the webinar uh, with myself, and I'm going to talk about sampling for uh, pesticide, resi uh, pesticide residues. And we'll go really all the way from uh, sampling through uh, you know, receiving the results and uh, you know, a quick slide on what to do if you get something unexpected. So, um, you know, th uh, there's a lot of in uh, preliminary information on pesticides available. If you look at our website, where we have some of the uh, recordings of some of our past, um, you know, free webinars available. But uh, for here, just to kind of move things along, I'm just going to hit a few key points on uh, pesticides. Uh, you can see the, uh, you know, uh, FD&C Act, uh, Section 408, you know, which generally says that, uh, you know, any pesticide residue that's found uh, in or on a food is considered unsafe unless it's either under the, uh, you know, tolerance that's set by the EPA or if it's just exempt from uh, the requirement for a tolerance. So basically, uh, you need to, you know, um, the pesticide residue is what's left on a you know, piece of food or agricultural commodity after you know, uh, the pesticide's been applied and you've gone through harvest and any processing. And that needs to be less than the MRL. Uh, the MRLs are specific for, the, uh, for a given chemical and uh, you know, food or crop group. And if there's not an MRL set, or in uh, the US we call them a food tolerance, if there's not a tolerance set for that combination, then any detectable amount is considered legal. Right. Uh, just as a review for the uh, regulatory agencies that are involved with uh, pesticides is, you know, surprisingly enough, uh, when we're talking about uh, governmental ent entities, it gets a little complicated. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency sets uh, tolerances. And then uh, enforcement is kind of split out between uh, either the USDA for uh, mostly animal products, uh, the FDA for everything else, and then uh, sometimes you can have uh, state regulatory agencies like uh, CDPR here in California that uh, you know, might uh, 
you know, lay some ad additional requirements on top of what the uh, federal government does and then uh, do their own regulatory uh, you know, enforcement. So let's get into uh, testing for uh, pesticides and you know, sampling uh, specifically. So this is a real simple uh, cartoon of the process. Uh, you know, we start with uh, a lot, right? The you know, uh, shipment or harvest or you know, whatever the group of commodity that you want to know what the uh, residue level is for. Uh, from there, you're going to take a sub-portion of that uh, lot and submit it to a laboratory, uh, you know, like, <clears throat> like us. Um, you know, from there, the laboratory is going to uh, probably homogenize that sample so that, uh, you know, every, you know, all parts of it are nice and uh, equal in terms of the residue level. Uh, maybe take a smaller portion of that for actual testing. And then, uh, you know, go through a series of steps to kind of separate the target analyte, uh, the pesticide or pesticides from the rest of the commodity, right? The more you can get out of the sample, the, you know, the better the uh, analysis goes, not to get too deep into things. Right. And then from there, uh, we see uh, just what is there and how much of it is there. And uh, results are, of course, uh, reported to the client. So if we consider uh, where things go wrong, um, you know, in the pesticide testing world, um, you can kind of split it out into uh, these three areas. Uh, you know, sampling error, um, where you take a sample that is just not representative of the lot as a whole. Uh, maybe it has a higher or a lower residue than, you know, if you were to average everything that's in that lot. Uh, we have sample preparation errors where something goes wrong in that, uh, you know, process of homogenizing and kind of cleaning up the sample. And then analytical error where something goes wrong with the measurement. Um, now, these numbers come from uh, some work by uh, Tom Whitaker, uh, you know, a statistician, um, I believe in uh, North Carolina now, uh, worked for the USDA for many years. Um, and this is for mycotoxins, which tend to be a little spottier than uh, pesticides are, but it gives you a good idea of really where the error comes from. Um, and, you know, going through, uh, you know, a large set of data found that, you know, about 80% of total test error, you know, uh, inaccuracy between the final result and the actual amount of, uh, you know, say the pesticide or the mycotoxin concentration in a lot of a commodity, you know, that comes from sampling error. So it's really critical that, uh, you know, a good deal of care is taken to collect a sample that's going to be representative, um, you know, uh, as I tell people when they submit samples, you know, if you don't if the residue isn't in the sample that you submit, then there's nothing in the world that a laboratory can do to, uh, to measure it. So uh, some things to think about, right? Uh, it begins just uh, with the uh, lot. So, you know, uh, consider when thinking about the pesticide residue, uh, one thing to think about and, you know, how you collect your sample, one thing to think about is, you know, where is the, uh, you know, how is the pesticide applied or where is the residue or the contamination that you're trying to measure coming from? So I've got, uh, you know, in this uh, highly detailed cartoon here, uh, kind of three different uh, scenarios. Uh, so, you know, one, uh, say something like a fumigation or if we're talking about a, uh, maybe a naturally occurring contaminant, uh, like uh, say acrylamide forming from uh, heat processing of uh, dried fruit, you know, that's something, you know, these are things that tend to be uh, fairly uniform across a lot of a sample. So, you know, in this situation, uh, you know, where you grab your subsample from isn't that important. Uh, on the other hand, if we have spray, which, uh, you know, maybe you've got a part of the plant that's more protected from the spray or, uh, you know, gust of wind when you're in that part of the field or, you know, but that can be a little spottier. And then, uh, you know, finally, uh, you know, drift where we're now we're looking at uh, contamination from, you know, pesticide that's applied to a different field and maybe the wind is blowing it over into a field that wasn't meant to be treated. So, you can see that, uh, you know, depending on, you know, how the uh, residue is, uh, you know, kind of interacting with the, you know, the field or the lot of commodity that's being treated, um, you know, there are different considerations that you need to take in taking your sample, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. I, um, you know, one thing to, uh, that I want to throw in here, and we'll talk about this uh, later on in the webinar, but, um, you know, before you get into collecting your sample or anything else, 
if uh, you need to collect the sample because you've got a FDA detention hold or some similar regulatory agency, if you're doing it because uh, you know federal or local uh, regulatory agency is telling you to, um, you know, before you do anything, you know, call the laboratory and uh, make sure that you're you know collecting the prop the sample properly because you know, some of these regulatory agencies have very specific ways that they want you to collect the sample or in the case of an FDA detention uh, that you know somebody else needs to collect the sample. So you really wanna check in with a laboratory that's gonna do the analysis before you do anything. Right. But if it's uh, just for your own information, uh, you know, because you wanna know if you uh, have a residue that's in exceedance you know, before you ship it overseas and you know, uh, potentially it gets rejected. Um, you know, this is some uh, good advice on uh, you know, things you know, uh, in considering the sample size that you wanna to submit to the lab. Again, uh, the goal here is to collect the sample that's as representative of possible of the uh, lot that you're testing. So if we take a look on the uh, right-hand side, you can see, you know, depending on the uh, size and a little bit on the type of uh, commodity, this is from the uh, FDA operation manual. Uh, they select uh, different sample sizes. Um, and you, it really, it's uh, what it's based on mostly is the size of the commodity that you're uh, having tested, right? So, you know, if you have, uh, you know, very small things like uh, spices or herbs, uh, you know, seeds or grain, then, you know, uh, you're getting a lot of you know individual pieces in a smaller sample you know so half a kilogram or you know uh, one kilogram and that you know again as long as you're collecting it uh, you know carefully and you know making sure uh, maybe the lot's well mixed before you collect that sample you're probably going to get a good uh, representative sample with a smaller amount um, on the other hand if you take uh, large uh, products uh, you know cabbages grapefruits things like that you know, then, uh, you know, a pound or two pounds worth isn't really that many individual units. So um, it's noted here at least uh, five units for large uh, products, at least 10 for medium ones. And again, you just want to make sure that you're getting enough different pieces of uh, fruit or produce or whatever your commodity is that you have a good chance of collecting a representative sample. Um, something else to keep in mind when collecting that sample is that pesticide regulations refer to the edible portion of the crop. So, you know, uh, you know while you might, uh, you know, coming in with the harvest, some might be twigs and soil and things like that. Um, you know, really, if you can do it easily, uh, try to leave those out when you submit your sample because you don't want the pesticide residue that the lab is uh, measuring to say come from some soil that was uh, you know, on your commodity rather than the uh, commodity itself. Right. Um, some other things to think about if you're collecting that sample from a field, um, you know, this is just a, uh, you know, random uh, printout from Google Maps, but, uh, you know, take that field and uh, impose a imaginatory, uh, imaginary uh, 10 by 10 grid, and then just kind of randomly select 10 areas to sample. Um, you know, then you can combine that into a single composite sample. So if you have those uh, medium sized uh, commodity and you need 10 pieces of fruit to uh, submit, then, uh, you know, take one piece from different areas in the, you know, uh, across your field, uh, combine them together, and uh, hopefully that'll be fairly representative of the lot. Now, if you suspect drift, then you don't want to uh, composite them like that. But, you know, if, uh, say if we you know, have a uh, drift suspected coming in from the east here, then maybe you wanna collect one or two that's near where you think the uh, contamination came from, and then uh, one or two that's far away from it. So you can hopefully see a difference. Uh, yeah, you know, our neighbors applied uh, acephate. Uh, we get a lot of acephate over here. We don't get a lot of acephate uh, here on the west side. Um, you know, that's you know, pretty good evidence that uh, drift ha occurred. Um, other things to think about, um, you know, especially if you're uh, processing the commodity, um, you know, just when do you collect that sample that's going to be submitted for pesticide testing? So uh, I pulled this slide from a presentation I gave to a bunch of uh, winemakers, but you know, I, I leave it in here because it's good because there's a lot of uh, processing steps. So it's, uh, I think, informative on how uh, things you want to think about when deciding when to collect your sample. So uh, you know, again, uh, specifically for wine, if we're starting off from grapes coming in from the field, well, you know, you've got a lot of different samples there potentially. Uh, so you know, that gets a little costly. 
but uh, you know, if you're able to, you know, uh, shown by uh, the red here, if you're able to identify the lots that might have that uh, residue that's over the limit, um, this is the earliest in the process, so it's easiest to kind of remove those or re you know, uh, recondition those or something. So you haven't put in all the work that, might, uh, that you might do farther on in the process. Uh, then, you know, we can have it all uh, combined into juice. See, now uh, you see that this, uh, you know, these individual pieces of contamination have kind of spread across the whole thing. But, uh, you know, now there are fewer samples and it's still fairly early in the process. So you might consider taking a, uh, rather than several samples of uh, grapes, maybe just uh, one sample of juice. Um, you know, then uh, you have uh, unblended wine. So you know, turn the juice into wine. Maybe you have a reduction in the pesticide level uh, from, the fer you know, from the fermentation and aging. Um, so you might want to sample then. Uh, but then again, you know, now you're putting more and more work into it. Uh, you know, so it you know, really is going to be uh, disappointing, let's say, if you've got to uh, get rid of the whole thing because it's in violation. So, you know, uh, you know really, uh, you know, again, speaking for wine, we get uh, samples submitted all the way um, at all points of this process, just depending on the customer and, uh, you know, what their situation is like and the decisions that they make. So these are all things to think about. So um, I get a, you know, I get a lot of phone calls and emails for people that, you know, um, hello, you know, do you test for pesticides? And uh, yeah, you know, but uh, we do a lot of pesticide tests. Um, you know, what exactly do you, uh, do you need? Are there specific pesticides you need to test for? And then, uh, you know, the answer is usually, well, um, you know, pesticides, everything. So I like to, uh, when you know, doing these talks, I like to take a second and just, uh, you know, talk about the process of the actual laboratory testing and what testing for you know everything looks like. So, because uh, we you know, um, as I'm located in the uh, state of California, which does a lot of uh, pesticide reporting, uh, I can go to the CDPR website and you know pull off a list like this, which is uh, you know my combined list of the uh, you know most commonly used pesticides in California. So, you know, don't worry about uh, being able to see this. Uh, you know, if you were to zoom in here, you know, there's a lot of things that are, you know, listed and reported as pesticides, you know, citric acid, vegetable oil. Um, my favorite is the uh, putrescent whole egg solids. Uh, I guess, you know, there's a couple pounds uh, applied in California every year as a deer repellent. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, kind of filler things in here that we don't really consider pesticides. So if I go and just uh, kind of, you know, remove everything that's not a, you know, kind of classic pesticide, um, you know, we're left with the lists like this. Uh, so kind of the top uh, 72 pesticides applied in the state of California in, uh, I believe, 2017. So what does it take to test all of these compounds? So if we take a step back, um, you know, chemicals and, you know, pesticides, which are chemicals, uh, we can kind of plot it on a chart like this, um, where we have uh, polarity on one axis. So is it something uh, fat soluble or more water soluble? And volatility on the other, right? Is it uh, more like a gas or, you know, going up through a solid for low volatility? So if we, uh, you know, consider this, uh, you know, kind of 2D universe of chemicals, then, uh, you know, most, you know, kind of large general pesticide screens cover an area, you know, like this, right? So this is a, uh, you know, general screen, um, you know, you see them reported, uh, you know, 300 compounds, 400 compounds, um, a lot of, you know, commonly used pesticides listed here, you know, so carbamates, organophosphates, neonicotinoids, et cetera, et cetera. So this covers a lot of ground, but, you know, you can see that we're, really kind of missing some area around the edges here. And, you know, right up here is uh, glyphosate, which is, you know, really one of the top chemicals used in California. So to kind of cover the rest of this space, um, you know, you see that the general screens miss maybe, you know, very polar compounds, uh, you know, like, uh, like glyphosate or EBDCs. Um, it misses ones that are very uh, volatile, uh, you know, methyl bromide, uh, phosphine, sulfur dioxide, uh, and other things that are used as uh, fumigants mostly. And then, uh, you know, some things on the low volatility end, like maybe uh, quaternary ammonium sanitizers or, uh, you know, mineral oil and other contact hazards. So, 
Um, and then, so, you know, it takes, uh, so, you know, really to kind of cover everything, it takes some more testing. And, you know, really it can get more complicated than just what's on this graph because uh, you have things like uh, EBDCs. So these are uh, this class of compounds, uh, ethylene bis carbamates. And, you know, while that's in this uh, general, you know, very polar uh, area, it needs to be tested for separately because of its uh, chemical reactivity. Um, you know, very basically, um, you know, sulfurs kind of make things difficult to measure. So, you know, to get these uh, class of compounds, you have to measure them separately from the rest of the, uh, you know, very polar pesticides like glyphosate. And that's usually done by uh, converting them to uh, carbon disulfide and measuring that. And if you look at the uh, regulations for these compounds, uh, you can see that, you know, uh, by measuring carbon disulfide, um, there's a unified MRL that covers uh, this entire class of uh, compounds. So MANEV, MECAZEV, uh, Xyram, et cetera. So if we were to kind of summarize the testing required to cover, you know, just, you know, again, this is just 72 compounds, although, uh, you know, there's you know, many hundreds more that fall into these general categories. Uh, we end up with uh, one, two, three, four, five different screens uh, required, uh, you know, just to cover the top uh, 100 California pesticides. And, you know, I like to, I've never actually uh, had a request for, uh, from someone to measure copper ethylamine uh, complexes, but I like to leave it in this list because you know it shows that you know, even then with all this testing, uh, you always get a couple oddballs that are left out. Uh, probably uh, we'd measure this by uh, measuring the copper. So um, you know the the idea, point here is that uh, we can do complete coverage. Uh, we can you know, test for just about anything that's likely to show up. But, uh, you know, it does require a lot of testing, which can get expensive. So you really need to, you know, think about what is the most like, what are the most likely compounds that you expect to find on your, uh, on your commodity? Um, you know, what is your uh, cost, you know, who are, whoever you're shipping to or selling to, what do they require? Things like that. So you can get a little strategic about exactly which tests you need to perform. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, the other question I get is, well, you know, how did this residue get on my commodity? So, I mean, um, really, this is the hardest one for me to answer because, you know, of course, I'm just in the lab. So I can, you know, suggest to someone, uh, you know, the various ways that you might get an accidental residue, but then I never find out for certain what happened. You know, they kind of take that information and go off and do their thing. And, uh, you know, nobody gets back to me to let me know how it, uh, how it wrapped up. But, um, you know, these are some, uh, you know, common uh, sources of uh, unexpected residues. So this can be uh, things like applicator error, you know, maybe uh, they grabbed the wrong bottle or uh, you didn't clean out the uh, spray tank uh, well between using one pesticide and the next. Um, equipment malfunction, so maybe uh, more was applied or you know, spottier than uh, expected. Um, you know, we mentioned drift from uh, neighboring fields. Um, you know, also, you know, as kind of uh, residential areas and agriculture areas kind of grow closer and closer together. Uh, you can have uh, residential, uh, you know, weed control and things like that, uh, you know, uh, cause some contamination. Um, you know, also animal intrusion, uh, you know, uh, animal, you know, we had someone that wanted to uh, measure uh, rodenticides in chicken manure because uh, that they were going to use uh, for organic fertilizer. And I guess the, you know, rats will eat the poison, uh, then, you know, get into the manure and, you know, die. And, you know, there's a potential contamination of the uh, presumably organic manure from that uh, rodenticide. And then, uh, you know, a host of other things, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you get uh, one pesticide that forms from a, you know, from the degradation of another one. And, you know, way down here, um, you know, make sure you ask, uh, you know, and that they're doing all their, uh, you know, quality controls, because there is always the possibility of laboratory error. So um, that's kind of uh, the end of the uh, material for pesticide uh, sampling. Um, I've got my uh, contact information here. If you have any uh, you know, specific questions, you know, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me. But, uh, you know, as uh, Tom uh, cues up his uh, presentation, um, you know, I'd be glad to take any questions.
Wiley, I think you do have a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, so we have a question, um, you know, so when talking about uh, sampling from a field, um, is this uh, for the entire field or for, okay, so uh, someone was asking if uh, when I said, uh, you know, maybe 10 pieces of, uh, I think there was medium sized commodity, um, is that for across the entire field or just for each of those, uh, you know, individual boxes in that 10 by 10 uh, imaginary grid? Um, so that was for the entire field, um, you know, you know, by all means, don't be afraid to take a larger sample. But, um, you know, again, uh, you know, 10 pieces, uh, you know, or the, you know, one or two kilograms being kind of the, you know, minimum suggested amount to ensure a good sampling. And you just want to make sure that you're collecting those 10 pieces from different areas across the field. Again, again, in, gets, like, in case there was any difference uh, when applying it. See, All right. uh, yeah, I don't see any other questions. Um, you know, if questions uh, come to you as we go through the presentation, uh, you know, please feel free to put them into the chat or in the uh, Q and A section, and uh, you know, we'll uh, you know, get to them as we uh, go through the uh, material. So uh, I'll hand things off to Tom now. Sampling for mycotoxins is our next topic. Thank you, Wiley. Um, a few basic things to think about. We're really talking here about molds, and molds certainly can spoil the appearance of food, producing like musty off flavors, uh, visible spoilage. Uh, look, looking at the fruit, of course, to the left there, we wouldn't really want to eat that. But in addition to um, sensory issues and, and issues that make the food unpalatable, it can also, these molds can conceivably produce toxins. And a number of these species produce different types of toxins. Uh, one example is aflatoxin produced by Aspergillus flavus, and that's the molecule for aflatoxin right there on the lower part of the slide. A couple of the common mycotoxins we deal with, as I mentioned, different species produce different types of um, mycotoxins. Aflatoxin is produced primarily by Aspergillus flavus and Parasiticus, two relatively common spoilage molds. There are four different chemical forms of it. Uh, B1, B2, G1, and G2, um, based on their colors as they fluoresce, B for blue, G for green. B1 appears to be the most toxic, and some countries actually regulate the levels of B, uh, B1. And um, the reason that they regulate that is because there are some serious health effects, both acute and chronic effects, including liver damage, cirrhosis, cancer, and immunosuppression that can occur from, from aflatoxins. So at high levels, it can cause some very serious issues. That's why they want to make sure that the levels are very, very low in our foods. Another mycotoxin that we commonly test for is ochratoxin A, which is produced by a, a mold called Aspergillus carbonarius. It produces a number of different types, with ochratoxin A being the most significant. Um, we know that in high levels that can cause kidney damage, and there's some possibility that it could be a carcinogen. Ochratoxin A isn't currently regulated in the United States, but it is regulated in certain foods in the EU. So speaking of the European Union, uh, one of the most um, uh, aggressive regulators in terms of levels of mycotoxins in foods is the European Union. And uh, we do a lot of testing and screening for um, tree nuts that are exported to the EU. Uh, in any sampling plan, of course, the goal is to have a random sample, right? We want it to be random and representative of the lot. We don't want to show any bias in terms of how we're sampling. Uh, this is a picture of one of our um, inspectors out in a field. He's got a large um, cardboard uh, tote that's filled with nuts. It looks like pistachio nuts and he's put that large steel probe in at sort of a diagonal uh, pattern into the probe so he can get a good cross section from one side to the other and down through the entire uh, level of that container. So he's trying to get as representative of the sample as he can from that load. Um, the European Union regulates the size of the samples too and uh, we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, in the following slides, but under their regulations, you need to take 20 kilograms total for a lot size that's greater than or equal to 15 tons. It's a sliding scale depending on the size of the lot. And the 20 kilos, if you do the math, is like 44 pounds of nuts. So that's an awful lot of product. Um, we're talking basically 100, 200 gram incremental samples. So if we were doing, say, packaged goods, we would want to get at least 100 200 gram samples and in e the EU they will look at things like consumer packages off the shelf. Here of course when we're doing bulk sampling uh, it's a little bit different. We don't have quite the issue of, of pulling out 20 kilos. 
Once we get those samples, they would come back to the lab and they would be split into two 10 kilogram subsamples for grinding and sampling. And, and Wiley mentioned Dr. Whitaker. Uh, Dr. Whitaker is an expert on mycotoxins and um, he has basically gone through and validated some of those curves for sampling to show that this is going to give you a very reliable answer in terms of the, the contamination level per load. Once they would come back to the laboratory, again, in the regulation, it said must be uh, separately ground finely and mixed thoroughly to achieve complete homogenization. So they actually specify uh, how well mixed uh, this sample has to be. Um, and in our laboratory, we use two different ways of doing that. Um, we can either use a dry grinding system, which basically turns nuts into a powder or a fragment, uh, or a slurry mixer. In this case, we'd combine those nuts with water to make like a pistachio pudding. Um, so the slurry mixing system here shown on the right is the preferred method for uh, many samples, particularly those that are um, hard to grind up like dried fruits or, or sticky materials where it's difficult to get it thoroughly ground just using a dry mixing method. Uh, some materials like nuts um, can be ground fairly well with a dry mixer, but there are a number of items that we have to use that slurry or water mixer. And this just kind of shows you what that same sample of pistachios in that original picture would look like as it came out of the sample prep. <clears throat> the dry grind, you can see, is a little more chunky, but the slurry just turns into a, a, a putty. Um, they're much more homogeneously mixed than the dry grind samples. And we do have some clients in the European Union that do their own testing above and beyond the regulatory requirements, and they say you must use a slurry mixer because it does give the most homogeneous mix. Samples that are ground for that European Union testing have to have a coefficient of variation less than or equal to 20%. So we basically have to go through and do multiple samples and be able to show that we same, get the same reliable results again and again. You know, the thinking being if we thoroughly homogenize that sample, the levels of aflatoxin should be uniform throughout it. And again, this is all part of getting a good evaluation of what the levels are in that sample. Um, when we actually test aflatoxin, this is kind of what it looks like, basically. It's a very simplified version of what goes on in an HPLC. Basically, we take this extract of that putty or, or that dry grind, and we run it through these columns. Uh, they show you these little rod-like shaped objects down here in these columns, and they have a material inside, a packing material, that basically, it's like a filtration system, kind of separates out the different chemical compounds into different bands. And then as they go through this system, they're pumped in a liquid form, they actually go into a detector, which can look for um, chemicals, the signature of those chemicals, either through a fluorescence or a UV or some other type of method. And we can actually see uh, each of these individual peaks as they've separated out in the column. And of course, the G2, G1, B2, and B1, those are the four forms of the aflatoxin. Um, interestingly enough, we mentioned the European Union does uh, this testing. The Japanese uh, have their own test method, which involves three five kilo samples. A number of the folks here in the United States have basically looked at the results they get using a Japanese method versus uh, uh, the method that the, uh, the Europeans dictate. And they find that the European Union testing is, is pretty much equivalent to what Japan has. But they have their own system of three five kilo samples and pulling multiple samples out of each of the five kilo samples for analysis. So the bottom line is, depending on where you're shipping in the world or depending on who the client is, they may have their own unique sampling and testing requirements, and it's, it's to your advantage to understand those and be aware of them. Let's shift gears kind of quickly here to microbiology sampling. We'll start with environmental sampling. Uh, a number of you folks on the line may work in a food processing facility. Um, so we're basically looking for contamination in the food processing environment. We may take samples of surface swabs using the sponge type methods, dust, scrapings, uh, water or air samples from that facility. Uh, if we're using the, the swab methods, we can use either a sponge type swab, which is a larger um, surface area coverage, or the smaller Q-tip style ones that can get into small nooks and crannies to look for contamination. You might need sterile, sterile scoops, spatulas, or sample cups. Um, we have different zones in the facility usually. The product contact sites where the product is actually in direct contact, we typically are looking for some of the indicator organisms, so we'll get sort of a number. Um, that we can use for evaluating our sanitation activities. Typically, we're not looking for pathogens on those spots, but the testing might include things like aerobic plate count coliforms or enteric bacteria. 
farther out in the plant environment, floors, walls, uh, other areas that are adjacent to food processing, we're going to be looking for those pathogens like salmonella and listeria. Often those areas are not cleaned as frequently, and so you're more likely to find uh, an environmental contaminant in those areas. <clears throat> in terms of the sampling piece of this, if you're a sampler, you always want to work from zone one to zone four. Those product contact sites are going to be the cleanest areas, and so you want to start there and work your way out to the dirtier areas. A zone four might be something like, uh, you know, a loading dock. So you don't want to go straight from a, a grimy loading dock into your food processing area where you're trying to keep the food product clean. You know, you want to go from cleanest to dirtiest. And as you're doing that sampling, you need to practice good hygiene. I put the Almond Board uh, logo up there as a little shout out to them because they have an excellent guidance on uh, environmental monitoring. And these are pictures we actually took from that guide. You bottom line, you want to wash and sanitize your hands first, right? Put on sterile gloves before handling that swab. You need to change your gloves and sanitize in between the swabs. You have to think about the fact that only the non the only non-sterile surface the swab should touch is the sample site itself. So when you're doing environmental sampling, a big part of this is really keeping things clean, making sure that you do not contaminate uh, that environmental sample, that sponge or that scraping or what have you. Uh, we don't want to know what's on your hands. We want to know what's on the plant environment. In terms of environmental sampling, the areas that you sample can vary a lot too. It could be anywhere from 40 to 200 square inches for indicators or a larger area for pathogens. Pathogens are harder to find, so often you have to take a bigger sample. If you're sampling a zone one, that product contact site, you wanna make sure that you wipe that with some sort of a sanitizer after sampling, just to make sure that you didn't introduce any contamination. Some of the swabs have material on them to preserve those microbial samples. So you wanna make sure you're not contaminating that surface. Also, it's an excellent idea to always submit a negative control swab, basically a swab that was removed from the bag and just put right back in without being used. That evaluates the cleanliness of that, that swab or the sanitary nature of that swab, as well as your own practices of being able to handle it without cross-contaminating it. We want to check that and make sure that any contamination, again, that we see on the, on the uh, environmental samples we took actually came from the environment and were not due to the way the swab was handled or its own sanitary state. And of course, when you submit those samples, you want to make sure it's done properly. Um, you want to keep them nice and cool, preferably in some sort of an ice chest or a blue ice pack, and uh, they need to be tested within 48 hours. So you need to factor that in as far as when you're delivering it to the lab to make sure that they have plenty of time to test those. Let's talk a little bit about products. Um, so let's say we're looking at a, at a food product. When we're sampling, again, we have to use good sterile technique to avoid contamination. That's the number one thing uh, that I, I would recommend. Again, they have to be samples that are representative of the lot. So we want to make sure that every, every part of that lot has an equal chance of being sampled, right? We know that pathogens, for example, are in very low numbers and sporadic in occurrence. So the bigger the sample enrichment we take at the end of that kind of testing, the more likely we are at detecting a positive. So when you're sampling for pathogens, bigger is better because it increases your odds of finding that pathogen. Um, you may also run into what I call different types of sampling plans. Um, sometimes you'll have what are called two or three class attribute plans, and those are used for different types of microbes. So when we're testing for pathogens, we call it a two class plan. So it's basically a pass or a fail. You either find the pathogen, which is a fail, or you don't, which is a pass. In the case of a three class attribute plan, which is pass, acceptable, or fail, we're looking at sort of a sliding scale. These are for those indicator organisms that we described. And the numbers themselves um, can be used to evaluate the quality of that product. And I have an example here, an actual true example from a food product of a three class attribute plan. In this case, it's for um, a dried fig paste material. Um, and these are the properties that they have for microbiological parameters, looking at aerobic plate count, yeast mold, and coliform. And you'll find in those kind of plans that you'll have these little letters, a big M, small C, a little M, big M and these different numbers. So what this basically means, N is the number of random sample units from the material. So they want you to pull at least five random samples from that lot. C is the maximum allowable number of those units that yield unsatisfactory results. And in, un in this case, an unsatisfactory result um, would basically be a, the number that would fall between this lower case M and the bigger case M. So in the case of in this case is aerobic plate count was between 100,000 and, and 1 million, it looks like. 
And so basically you could have two of the five samples fall in this range. If any one of them falls above the larger number, the big M, then that's an automatic failure. So there's zero tolerance for going above that. Um, but basically this type of system, this three class attribute type testing is commonly used for indicator organisms. And it reflects the fact that as you're pulling multiple samples out of a product, you will find that there are some areas that have higher numbers and some areas that have lower numbers. And so uh, it kind of recognizes the fact that there is some degree of variability in that product. Now, when we're doing pathogen sampling, the example I'm using here is salmonella. <clears throat> it's a little bit different approach. If you look at the FDA guidance, the BAM manual, they call it bacteriological analytical manual, they have three different types of food categories for salmonella. Um, the first category is food not normally subjected to a, a lethal process or a cooking process for salmonella between the time of sampling and consumption, and it's going to be consumed by high-risk consumers, the age of the infirm and infants. Food category two um, is, again, product that would not normally be subjected to a lethality process, but it's not necessarily being consumed by those high-risk individuals. And food category three is something that would be subjected to uh, some kind of a process to kill salmonella. So you're going from the highest risk at one, two, and then down to three to the lowest risk. And that dictates how many samples you typically pull in this situation. They recommend under the FDA BAM, you're collecting 100 gram sample units from the lot. Again, random samples taken all over the lot. For those category ones, you're pulling 60 units or six kilos. Category two, 30 units or three kilos. In category three, 15 units or 1.5 kilos. So the amount pulled is highest depending on that risk. The higher the risk, the higher the amount. Once those get to the lab, you then subsample them and you can test either individual 25 gram analytical units in the lab. You can test them separately or combine them into 375 gram composites. So in the lab, that works out to either 60 samples or four composites for category one, 30 or two for category two, or 15 and one for category one. Again, we get away with a lower level of testing because the risk is lower, right? So that's what you typically see when you're doing pathogen testing. And they use the same approach for a number of other pathogens as well. And this just kind of highlights, this is actual data that we've collected in a research project we were doing, uh, the challenge of pathogen testing and, and sampling. Um, these were four large samples. In this case, they were nuts that, were, that had tested positive for salmonella, that first red square on the upper left reflects the fact that the first sample tested positive. So then we repeatedly retested them to see uh, how many other positives we might get, how positive is a positive. Uh, on three of the samples, we never hit another positive. And those numbers below estimate the population of cells, so one cell in a thousand grams. But on the fourth one over here, we see we got 3.4 cells per thousand grams. So we did get multiple hits. So you can't always tell when you retest what that means. You know, uh, if this little red square had been down here, we might have retested and thought, oh, the, the load is clean. But in fact, you know, there were several other hot spots in that product. So, you know, you don't necessarily find it again when you retest, even though it was, it was positive to begin with. In that same research study, we looked at, uh, I think, 72 samples of negative product. The initial product was negative, and we retested. 66 of those samples came up negative, but on six of the samples, we did in fact find some positives. And uh, one of them, at least, we had two positive findings. So um, again, you know, the point here is that pathogens occur very randomly and sporadically uh, in a food product. So when you find a positive, you really have to respond to it. And that's the key point I make with this slide. Uh, testing is really designed to find one cell in a in a composite sample, right? So when we test, we're basically taking that sample, we're putting it in an enrichment and the microbe is going to grow. You know, we may have one target contaminant in there, one little lonely cell, but it's going to grow and multiply and then we can detect it. But if we had that same 375 gram sample with two parts per billion aflatoxin, which is the limit on some commodities going to Europe, when we do the math, that actually equals 10 to the 15th B1 molecules, aflatoxin molecules. So, you know, one with 15 zeros behind it, you know, billions and billions, literally, of molecules. Uh, it reflects the differences that you see in sampling for chemistry versus sampling for microbiology. 
when you're dealing with chemistry, uh, even though the amounts are very tiny, for example, with the pesticides that Wiley was describing, the, the com concentrations in parts per million may be relatively low, but the number of molecules in that part per million is relatively high because you're dealing with very tiny objects. So if we homogenize that sample or we sample it thoroughly, we should see many, 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 many molecules, many, many target contaminants scattered throughout that sample. We can resample or retest uh, a product for a mycotoxin or for uh, a chemical contaminant like a pesticide, and we should be able to get similar answers each time. With pathogens, you really can't do that because it's a needle in a haystack. You literally have that one organism uh, that you're hoping to enrich if you get that, if you happen to sample it. You may get it once and not see it again, even though you take 20 or 30 samples. So the bottom line is you can't really retest a food product for a positive pathogen finding. And if you try to do that and get negatives and release the loads, you may wind up like Peanut Corporation of America with huge recalls and people ill and dying. So it's, it can lead to very big problems. Quickly about water sampling. Uh, this is a water sampling guidance that we have. Um, again, you want to use good sterile technique. You want to wash your hands and apply sterile gloves. Uh, you need to have an appropriate uh, sterile sample container taken from the lab for your water samples. Um, you want to really disinfect that bib or that hose outlet or whatever it is that you're sampling uh, to make sure that you don't have any contamination on the outside of it that gets into the water sample. Again, you want to let that water run for three to six minutes to flush the lines of any contaminants to make sure that you're really getting a good representative sample of that water. We don't want to know what the crud is that was living in the edge of that spigot. We want to know what the actual water looks like. Pop open that container. There will be a little tablet on the inside and that is a preservative. We don't want to rinse that out. That's used to preserve the water sample so that it gets to the lab in good shape. You need to fill the water up to the 100 mil line, and that's a critical thing in water sampling. You really need to fill it up to the limit. If it's below that level, uh, it's just uh, it's not a sample that we can use because the testing is done per 100 milliliters. So always make sure that it is filled to the line, sealed properly, and um, labeled ac accordingly with the information and taken to the lab. Again, water sampling in the case of the FISMA, we need to get that six to seven hours. Uh, after sampling, okay? So, so we need to get it right away. Water is much more perishable. And we want to keep that nice and cool uh, during that transport process so that nothing grows in there. Okay, and that's, I have very, very quick uh, time here for any questions. Any questions for me? No, no questions? Right. Well, you know, thank you, Tom. Um, you know, I'm, you were talking about the difference between uh, you know, micro uh, testing and, you know, uh, pesticide or chemical testing. And I think the uh, analogy you used once is it's like, uh, you know, uh, with um, micro, you know, with pathogens, it's like raisins in a cookie dough. Exactly. Where you reach in and grab some and maybe you get a raisin or maybe you don't where, you know, pesticides, you know, maybe it's more like uh, sugar or salt where if you've mixed that dough up well enough, every, you know, every little bit of it should have some, uh, you know, a decent amount of sugar and or salt in it. Absolutely. All right. So uh, I don't see any questions. Again, uh, you know, feel free to, you know, submit questions either to the Q&A or the uh, chat. You know, if they come to you while we're talking, uh, you know, whichever one of us is not uh, speaking at that time can, uh, you know, break in if it's a uh, question that needs, um, you know, uh, immediate clarification or we can, you know, we'll, or we'll save them till the end. Uh, so it looks like you do have a question, Tom. Uh, yes. So what does it mean uh, when you said, you know, no retesting for uh, pathogens? Can you clarify that? Yeah, I think when you retest a product, and then what I mean by that is when you're retesting for pathogens, you, you cannot use that as a means of clearing that product. So let's say that we've had a positive for salmonella or listeria in a food product, and we retest it and we get a negative. That doesn't mean that everything's fine because of the fact that pathogens occur in these sporadic clumps in a food product, uh, we cannot reliably say that that product is free of contamination. You have to really treat a positive result, a positive finding as that whole load is conceivably contaminated. I must do something about it. I must pasteurize it or I must do something uh, to render it safe. That's really what I mean. So is it, uh, would it be accurate for me to say that a you know, with, uh, you know, pathogen testing, uh, a single negative result, you know, may not be, you know, may not be negative or, you know, can't be, 
you can't assume that the whole load is safe, but with a single positive result, uh, you kind of need to treat the whole load like it's contaminated. That's exactly right. And even interestingly, when you bring up about the negative results, that's how HACCP came about because they realized that even if they tested product exhaustively and got a bunch of negatives, they couldn't reliably verify that that product would be safe. Um, the space program dictated that it be very, very safe before the astronauts were able to go to the moon. And that's really was kind of the, some of the founding principles that went into the HACCP system um, back in the 1960s. Um, all right, and then a follow-up question. Um, how would you end up uh, clearing a load? Well, so if you have a positive, uh, basically one of the ways that people have looked at this is, is by valid, through validated means. So if you have a validated process to, to knock something out, you know, let's say you do propylene oxide treatment or you have a pasteurization method, uh, the expectation is that that should be sufficient to do the job. And typically, uh, for example, if you have a recall, we're going to get into FDA detention here in the last few minutes, but that's what FDA would look at. So if you had a load that came back uh, and it was positive for salmonella, they'd want you to come up with a reconditioning plan and it would typically involve some sort of lethality step to knock out the, the salmonella. But it now has for, to be a validated process. Right. Now for you know, chemical contamination, say mycotoxins or, uh, mycotoxins or chemicals, um, you know, that's where you can go back and maybe resort or, you know, uh, wash or peel and, um, you know, test again. And if that comes back negative, then you can, you know, uh, depending on who you're dealing with, you might be able to release that product. That's right. And like with mycotoxins, we know there's a correlation, for example, with aflatoxin and insect damage. So uh, like in the tree net industry, they're very good at doing, you know, screening with, with uh, their, you know, detector systems basically using using the reject systems to basically go through and kick out the products that have uh, insect damage and that often reduces the mycotoxin level. Okay. So uh, we've got a couple minutes left and you know we do want to uh, go through um, FDA detention samples uh, you know quick, uh, briefly because you know this is really where there's a lot of uh, very specific requirements for uh, you know how you take your sample and how you handle them, and where things can go wrong. Um, I, I see we have another question in that we'll uh, get to at the end of the uh, presentation, if you don't mind. So I'm going to uh, you know skip through some of the introductory slides. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, surveillance programs um, you know for looking at uh, you know different types of contamination, but really it's the uh, FDA regulatory monitoring where uh, that they use for enforcement. Uh, so you can see here, um, you know, several set of thousands of samples taken every year. Uh, you have many residues uh, analyzed, and this might be targeted to where there have been uh, past violations or, um, you know, maybe uh, commodities that are eaten a lot by uh, susceptible populations like children. Um, here's some results, uh, 2017, which I think is still the most recent year for that they've released results for. Uh, but you can see, you know, domestically and imported, um, you know, really very few violations, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, really a high number of samples that have no uh, detected residue at all. Um, and, you know, slightly higher uh, violation rate in uh, imported commodity than uh, domestic ones, you know, for a number of reasons. So, um, you know, what happens when there is a violation? Uh, you know, this is for the FDA, specifically for MRLs. You know, um, if it's a uh, domestic food, then they will, uh, you know, may issue a warning letter to the, you know, people that, you know, grew that commodity, uh, you know, and there might be sanctions like, uh, you know, seizing the food to remove it from the channels of trade, or, um, you know, maybe an injunction that you need to go back and, you know, do that kind of reconditioning, uh, you know, resorting something to correct the cause of the uh, violation. Um, but with uh, imported food, um, you know, it may either be, it may uh, first off be refused entry into the United States, uh, you know, or at least into our channels of trade. And then uh, that firm or even that, uh, you know, uh, shipping uh, country might be placed under import alert, where uh, future samples from them might be, uh, you know, uh, susceptible to uh, detention without physical examination or the uh, FDA hold. So uh, this comes from, uh, you know, this authority comes from section uh, 801 of the uh, FFDCA. Again, the uh, proper total, uh, total uh, term is uh, detention without physical examination. 
And, um, you know, again, this hap can happen uh, based on, uh, you know, one violative sample, one violative shipment, uh, if they have some reason to believe that it might happen again. Um, and it can be uh, again, uh, related to a future uh, specific shipper, a specific grower, or even a country or geographic area. So uh, we've got a couple uh, examples here. So you can see uh, with this one, uh, alert 99-05 is for uh, this specific country uh, company out of uh, Chile for uh, dichloropropin lemons, as opposed to 99-15 uh, where uh, you know, uh, raisins from Turkey in general are uh, suspect, uh, susceptible to that uh, import hold. So um, the importer can test their loads and submit uh, evidence to the FDA that it doesn't have that uh, contamination. But, you know, again, there are uh, very strict uh, sampling and testing protocols that must be followed. And, uh, you know, when you get the, uh, the, you know, the detention hold, there is a deadline for uh, to respond to it, and you really need to make sure that the you know entire data package um, you know as the FDA will require is submitted to them within that deadline. Um, although you can uh, apply for an extension um, if a project's rejected, uh, it can either be uh, reworked or you know destroyed or you know sent to some other uh, export market. So. Um, this is uh, data from, the, uh, from us, from Safe Food Alliance. And just uh, looking at the FDA detention samples that we've received in the lab, uh, what are the reasons for those uh, detention? So uh, for us, the uh, you know, highest uh, uh, proportion is for aflatoxin, although that's probably biased a little bit because we do a great deal of aflatoxin uh, testing. Um, and then past that, uh, you can see, you know, just about evenly distributed between uh, pesticide violations, uh, pathogen violations, and then uh, some sort of uh, quality or maybe mislabeling. So uh, most importantly, what do you do when, you know, something you're trying to import is under uh, detention? So it'll come, you know, uh, make sure you read the detention notice uh, carefully. Things you want to note are, uh, you know, who, who are you working with? Who is the FDA compliance officer? Um, you know, what's the charge? What's the defect? Um, you know, what is it that you need to demonstrate isn't in violation? Is it di that uh, dichloroprop residue? Is it, uh, you know, past contamination with listeria? You know, what is it that they're concerned about? And then uh, maybe most importantly, again, that respond by date. Um, and, you know, uh, again, very important to note that you want to respond to this uh, as quickly as possible, um, both by contacting the uh, compliance officer and then uh, calling the laboratory that you're going to, you know, have do the testing if you're going to test it. Um, because, uh, you know, you need to make sure that uh, the sample is uh, collected properly. It's probably going to need to be done by a third party. So, you know, for instance, we would send someone to uh, collect the sample rather than having you uh, do it yourself. And then uh, depending on the results, there might be a requirement for uh, conditioning. And, um, you know, it's certainly preferable not to, but uh, you know, we may need to uh, request an extension. Um, you know, these FDA packets uh, can be easily 200 pages, um, you know, including not just the uh, report from our testing, but, uh, you know, the chain of custody for when we receive the sample, uh, also any movement of the sample within our lab, the training and resumes for any, uh, any of the scientists that handled the uh, sample and performed the analysis down to, uh, you know, certificates of analysis for any uh, reagents and, you uh, you know, uh, reagents and standards that we use. So, you know, uh, it can take uh, maybe two week turnaround time to get a full detention packet. So uh, again, very important that you uh, rep reply quickly. So, um, you know, all this is for, uh, you know, chemical contamination, uh, maybe quality uh, issues, uh, but there are some uh, specific uh, considerations when talking about microbial uh, defects. So I'll let uh, Tom respond to that. All right, thanks, Wiley. Yeah, in terms of FDA detentions in microbiology, you noticed one of the slices in the pie was that. Uh, again, we reference that investigation operations manual of the FDA. Uh, the seminal sampling plan, which I just took a snippet out of that page, uh, is typically what they follow for most microbial hazards. Uh, typically when FDA gets involved, it is salmonella or 
E. coli 0157 or listeria, one of the major pathogens, they typically treat this as a category one food, the highest risk. Uh, they may require N60 sampling uh, and testing sometimes. So sometimes they want you to test those 60 individual analytical samples. They may not even allow you to composite them. Um, the bottom line is you want to follow any specific FDA uh, guidance from the person in charge of that case in terms of how they want you to sample it. Do they want you to test the individual 60 samples? Can you composite? What are any special sample prep guidelines that they have for you? And of course, you want to use good aseptic technique to sample that product. Okay. All right, great. Well, um, I know we're a couple minutes over time, for which I uh, apologize to everyone. Um, you know, uh, Tom and I can hang out for a couple minutes if anyone has any uh, specific questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, feel, feel free to email us, uh, either us directly or, you know, call or uh, send a uh, email to the lab and we'll, uh, you know, reply to any questions you think of later. Uh, so, Tom, what's the uh, name of that form that you have there? Is that the uh, Salmonella Sampling Plan? It's the Investigation Operations Manual. In fact, it's a different chapter, I think, of the same manual that you referenced for doing yeah. pesticides. And so we can certainly, um, you can look that up. If you type FDA Investigation Operations Manual into the, your uh, server your, or your uh, search engine, it'll pop right up. If you Google it, it'll come right up. So it's available online and you can check it out. It has lots of good information, but uh, it is a little dry, uh, you know, as, as someone that uh, presents uh, presentations on uh, international pesticide regulations, I know from dry and that's uh, it's a little dry. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, um, again, I want to thank you all for your uh, kind attention. I hope this was uh, informative for everyone. And, um, you know, uh, again, any questions on uh, this material or, you know, food safety testing and regulations in general, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to uh, Tom, myself, or anyone else on our uh, laboratory team. And I hope everybody has a good day. Thank you very much, everyone.